pull up in the, the chat. Feel free, if you have questions along the way, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in, or I'll try to keep the chat box off to the side and monitor that. You can go ahead and put stuff into the chat also. Um, so first want to start about, you know, I think we all know what a sugar bush is, that it's obviously not a bush and some sugar, but it's that forest that we're collecting our sap from. So why do we care to actually manage that sugar bush? And it all comes down to this, that sugar bush is our main resource. You know, we can have really fancy, nice looking sugar house with all the latest equipment um, and nothing against the equipment. It's all important, but if you don't have an active productive forest, that equipment's not going to do you any good because you're not going to have any sap to process in it. So your money is really made in the woods because that is our, that's our factory. That is where our resources are coming from. And so it's important to, to think about and manage that um, efficiently. Um, so when we're, when we're thinking about uh, sugar bush management, it's good to first back up and think about what are our objectives that we want to have. So, you know, objective number one should be as maple operators is to that you want to be able to have maple trees that are healthy and that you can tap. Um, but you don't have to limit it to just that. But are there other objectives that we want to have? Are there, you know, other types of understory uh, plants that we want to be able to collect. We want to grow ginseng or other medicinal herbs, maybe in the understory. We want to be able to collect firewood. We need to collect firewood for our sugar house from there. Do we want to be cross-country skiing? Do we want to have A to B trails? Do we want to be able to hunt in it. So what are all the objectives that you want to have within that forested land? Um, it's good to document your resources you have. Um, that can be the equipment that you have to work within your land, um, but the resources within the land itself. Um, describing the property, what are the, you know, what it's, what's the topography, what are the soils like, I mean, we'll go over all these different things um, as we go throughout, and then what are the necessary actions that you need to take to reach the objectives that you want and to effectively manage um, that forest. So going back to thinking about why sugar bush management is so important, and it's because the trees, as I mentioned, are the factories. All those sugars that we are collecting, those are all being produced through photosynthesis, much like a solar panel catching that sunlight, turning that energy into sugars. It's pretty fascinating to think about how we can, you know, the trees are able to capture that sunlight, produce the sugars, and we can take that and make that delicious maple syrup. Um, and so remember that, you know, we, we spend all that time in the woods in the wintertime, tapping our trees and then collecting that sap in the end of winter. Um, but really, What's important for those trees is not what's happening always in March, April, or February, but really what's really important for those trees is what's actually happening right now and through June and July and August, because that's when all those sugars are being made. That photosynthesis, when those leaves are out, that's when, um, that's when all those sugars are being made. So there are just harvests. It's much like growing corn or tomatoes or strawberries, you know, where you have a that growing season and then a harvest, our harvest is just a little delayed um, until at the end of winter. And so what happens during that growing season is really important. And the more leaves we have, the more factories, the more sugars that are going to be produced. So think about that, especially as we're coming into the growing season, um, you know, how healthy are your trees? Look up at your canopy, assess, um, you know, are they, are they good, nice and green? Or is there water deficiencies or nutrient deficiency in those leaves? Or you have um, some kind of pest that's feeding on those leaves. How big is the canopy? Are there a lot of dieback in that canopy? Um, and remember that forests are living organisms. And what's that? What that means is that you know trees do die over time. They're not you know immortal. They are going to senesce. You know their trees are born, they grow, and they do eventually senesce. Um, but that and then also there are factors into that. So this picture on the left is after an ice storm, you see some trees bent over. So there are these natural events that will happen um, that will cause some setbacks to the trees, but as long as the trees are healthy, they're gonna rebound from that. The picture on the right is after a forest fire went through. This was um, a spot in New York that's you know not a typical fire prone area, but there was a forest fire that went through. Um, but the forests are living organisms. Some trees will die off, some will rebound uh, from that. And so when we're thinking about our sugar bush, we want to create these resilient forests. And what I mean by that is that forests that are able to um, take blows that, you know, if you have an ice storm, if you have eastern 10 caterpillars that 
chew the uh, chew some of the leaves and they have to push out new leaves that they have they're healthy they have a reserve of sugars of energy that they're able to rebound from that and it's not going to knock them back and um, decline them severely or kill the trees is that they're resilient that they can change over time and that they can withstand certain blows or threats that happen to them over time and they're healthy and productive uh, so when we when we're thinking about um, you know, sugar bush management, as I said, you know, it comes back to that sugar production, um, you know, when we're thinking about our syrup, you know, sap volume and then sugar production overall. And so between our sugar bush management, you know, if we have bigger trees, bigger canopies, you're usually going to collect more sap from those trees. But then also bigger canopies, you're typically going to collect sweeter sap. And we know that, you know, our ratio of the new role of 87 divided by your percent sugar gives that ratio. Um, I'm not sure from the little bit I've heard from Minnesota, I think the sap sugar was probably lower for you guys as well. It was certainly significantly lower for us in Lake Placid this past season, which really helped reinforce how important to sap sweetness is. And um, so just as an example that this year, we produce about the same amount of sap, the same volume of sap per tap this year as we did in 2019. Um, but 2019, we had a high sugar year. This year, we had a very low sugar year at our forest. And so the actual amount of syrup that we produced this year was almost a tenth of a gallon less than we did in 2019 with the same volume of sap per tap. So that sap sugar is obviously really important. The sweeter we can get that sap, um, you know, even though with reverse osmosis, this, this still the total amount of syrup that you make um, is important. So what controls the variability of that sap sweetness? One aspect is genetics. Um, we're not gonna hit on that today um, because genetics, you know, we're not necessarily gonna go out there and we're, we're gonna talk more about native established forests and we're not going out and planting trees. Um, I could do a whole nother talk on genetics um, and how that controls variability a little bit. And um, we have a, a plantation of some sweet trees in Lake Placid, so I've done some work with that, but we're gonna focus more on the environmental factors and the site quality because um, trees will vary outside of genetics, trees will vary um, from tree to tree, depending on the different environmental and site quality factors that are there. Um, so if we think about what's the site quality, what do I mean by that? Those are abiotic factors um, that are affecting productivity. So one of them is the climate. So obviously we know the weather um, is important, uh, the amount of the temperature, the water that we get, we can't really control that, unfortunately. Um, so what also comes into that then is the soils. And so the texture of the soils, how well is it drained? Um, it's a texture referring to how much, you know, is it sandy or is it clay, is it silt um, in your soils, which helps with nutrient holding capacity, water holding capacity. Um, so the drainage, the water, is it wet? Is it really dry soils? What's the pH? What's the nutrients within those soils? Um, so that's, uh, that's really important. So I got one question, I'll pause for, like, a question in the chat box asking at what tree diameter do you see a noticeable decline in sap production? Um, it's typically more of a linear relationship. That's not, it's hard to say exactly. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it just drops off that your sap production is gonna be significantly less once you're at an eight inch tree or 10 inch tree or anything like that. Uh, it's more of a linear relationship oftentimes and it's, you know, sometimes it's due to the size of the canopy. Um, so when we're when we're thinking about, you know, what size, and I'll come back to this a little bit later on, when we're thinking about the size of the tree, it's more about, you know, how much wood do you have that's going to not completely create too much compartmentalization to overdo the volume of the tree that's there. So we'll come back to that um, in a second. Um, Another question that just came in, my home woods does not have a lot of tree diversity. My sugar bush one hour from my home has many small six inch to three foot four, three to four foot tall maples that I would like to transplant. Um, I've been successful and sorry, scrolled off. Transplanting these maples. I have not been successful in transplanting these maples. Any tips, tricks or secrets help me transplant some maples out of my property? Uh, transplanting maples that have been natively grown in a forest can be really, really tough. Um, because they're the roots, you know, and like in a nursery where the roots are kind of trained to grow in a nice ball, um, they grow really shallow in a forest. So that can be tough. The only, the best trick that I would have is to say is to move them in the dormant season. If you can get them in, um, kind of the end of fall or early, early spring before they've leafed out, 
keep them watered, but get as many roots as you can. Um, another question, my sugar bush is very large multi truncated basswood trees. They provide way too much shade. I would like to open up my canopy and forest floor. They would supply more wood than I could burn for many years. Is there a market for basswood trees? Uh, I don't know much of market for basswood trees. You know, they're not the best firewood trees. It is used for wood carvers sometimes and for like lures, making like fishing lures and um, carving because uh, it's uh, usually a softer wood and that has a nice clean grain to it. Uh, but I don't know much about the market for them, um, unfortunately. Thank you. So oh, go ahead. So we have a question. No, just wanted to say thanks for the answers. You're welcome. Uh, so moving on, um, this is a, some of that one of my professors from grad school used to say that soils are, are really our resource and trees are actually just the crop. And because the trees are going to respond differently based on the type of soils that you have. And so soils are really important. Oftentimes we're looking at the above ground structure, but it's important to think about soils as well. So what's the preferred soils that we want for sugar maples? We want a nutrient rich um, Soils, sugar maple loves calcium um, as well. Uh, and we also want moist, but well-drained. So we don't want standing water. Red maple, if we're thinking more about red maple, it's important to think about they're, they're great to tap as well, a little bit lower in sugar, but it's still worth tapping. Uh, it still makes great syrup. So they will withstand heavier soils. Uh, if you've got a wet area in, in our forest where our red maples are typically a little bit lower down where we have some wet regions, the red maples grow there. Um, but for our sugar maples, they're, they're kind of picky. They don't want it too moist, but they do want, definitely want some good water. They don't want it dry as well. Um, and so another factor to think about is the roots in that the rule of thumb that I like to say is that roots are gonna spread two feet in one direction out from the tree for every inch of trunk diameter. So if you have a 10 inch diameter tree, so that's our, a, you know, a small tree that we're gonna be just starting to tap, 10 inch diameter tree, those roots are gonna be spreading out 20 feet in either direction from the base of the tree, so which is quite a ways. It's typically farther. An old rule of thumb was that the, the roots went out to the drip line, the drip line being kind of the edge of the canopy. If we imagine this as an umbrella, the water would come down and then drip off the edge straight down here on the other side that the roots would spread out, but it's usually oftentimes more like twice that, twice the width of the canopy. Um, so think about that. Um, and especially when you're working in your woods, that if you're out there, if you're doing some logging, cutting some trees out of your woods, you're out collecting sap or any work that, you know, if you're running, if you don't have good roads and you're going through the woods, you know, what damage are you doing to the roots? And also another factor is that most of the roots at least the water, there's anchor roots that are gonna go down, down a little bit deeper, but a lot of the fine roots, which are the roots that are actually bringing in the water and the nutrients are oftentimes in the top six inches of the soil in a forest. If there's a tree out in your lawn, it's gonna go down a little bit deeper, but most of that good organic soil with the, that is most of the water and nutrients is gonna be in the top um, six inches oftentimes. So if you're running machinery around there, how much damage are you potentially uh, doing to that um, overall. So questions about uh, earthworms. I'll come back to that. I actually have a slide in that, so not to skip over uh, that, but we actually have a slide, so I'll come, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so roots are important. The soil pH is important. Um, if you look up in any documents for sugar maple, the target range that they say for soil pH is 5.5 five to 6.8. I would guess that most of you probably don't uh, you may potentially, I don't, I'm not as familiar with Minnesota soils, but my guess is it's rare to, maybe not rare, but less common to have, you know, a forest soil that's, you know, into the 6.0 or higher range. You know, most forest soils are oftentimes, you know, in the, the 5 to, or even less sometimes. Uh, most of the soils in the Adirondacks here in our forest, you know, are in the 4 um, I think I did some samples last fall. I had some that just barely got over five, but most of them were in the four, 4.5. So um, it's so it's not uncommon to have a pH closer to five or lower. And that's not, you know, to, if you can get above five, though, it's, it's going to be the best because pH, why that's important, it's what allows nutrient availability. Um, and so when you get lower pH, 
less nutrients are going to be available, more aluminum is going to be available in the soils, and that can become toxic to the maples. Um, so when we have, and sugar maple wants more calcium, and the lower pH is going to be less calcium available. So the higher we can keep the pH, uh, that's better. So by adding lime, we get calcium into the soil that the sugar maples love, and that increases our pH, which can help other nutrients become available as well. Um, typically, you don't need to decrease the pH within a forested soil. Um, so I'll, we'll come back to this a little bit, but I actually have a, a research project I'm doing right now where I'm going to be um, pretty soon applying some nutrients, some lime, trying to create some targeted range for what folks should be applying. Unfortunately, I don't have the best answers. There's a lot of things, you know, add lime, but there's not good recommendations on the quantity that you should necessarily add. And so I'm trying to get some good um, tools for that, for producers to be able to have. Um, so we think about the nutrients, where do the nutrients actually come from within our forest soils that the trees are taking up? And where a lot of them come from is the parent material. That's the bedrock that's what those soils are built upon. Um, and it's from the weathering, from either um, chemical or just from water and things that are eroding rocks, that bedrock over time, that's what establishes soils and that's where most of your um, nutrients and that's, you know, the groundwork of our soils. The other piece is organic material. As we have, um, you know, decomposition of a tree that dies, all the leaves that a tree is dropping, any, you know, microbiota, animals that are um, dying off are decomposing, adding organic material and there's nutrients in that back into the soil. That's where we get a lot of the active nutrients that trees are taking up. Trees are, you know, they drop their leaves, the leaves decompose. Those are minerals that are then available for the tree to have again. Um, sometimes from the atmosphere, if we have legumes, um, so not as common in our forest, uh, unless you have maybe some locust in your forest, um, where through bacteria relationship, we can get atmospheric nitrogen. Um, but then there's also some deposition precipitation. There's nutrients in the atmosphere um, as well that'll come in through um, kind of deposition. So I just uh, I threw up here just a picture of a bedrock map of the different geology throughout Minnesota. So it varies, you know, throughout the state as you go to different regions. The bedrock is always going to be different, and that's going to affect your baseline of your soils. As well. So, one uh, just one example that I'd like to show this is a site where I did some, some of my graduate work. This is up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. This is the Bartlett Experimental Forest where this red uh, star is here. And that was granite uh, bedrock. The granite bedrock is typically lower in nutrients, especially calcium. Um, when you look at the understory of those forests, and it's not bad, it looks like a nice forest, but there's not a lot of understory plants going on. Where we look at over in the western side of the White Mountains, um, where it's a metamorphic rock, higher nutrients, and it's just really rich soils, much more lush in that understory, all kinds of different herbaceous plant materials and uh, woody kind of understory shrubby plant material. Um, just because that bedrock was different, the soils were different overall. So it's quite a drastic, you know, still not all too far apart. Um, I already mentioned kind of the decomposition, but just, just as an example, of, as I mentioned, you know, as those leaves drop and decompose that, you know, there's minerals going back in. So for a sugar maple leaf, as I mentioned, remember sugar maple loves calcium. Calcium is important for cell wall growth and structure. Um, so there's quite a bit of the calcium overall, you know, nitrogen, potassium, they're all being uh, released back into the soils. Um, so how do you know that you have a nutrient rich sugar bush? So one mechanism is to, to go out and take a soil sample. Um, that can be help it's the best if you really want to know you know how active are the you know do the trees have enough nutrients is more of what are they actually taking up and it's actually take a foliar sample that can be tricky to do uh, especially in a forest area the best method is actually to use a shotgun to shoot a branch out of the tree um, it's actually a scientific method believe it or not um, and shoot a branch down so you can get the leaves and do a foliar analysis but you can do it through soil testing as well. Um, but if we just want to look at what are some quick indicators by just walking out in our forest, and obviously you can look at, you know, look up at the canopy to see um, how healthy um, are the, you know, the canopy of the tree, you can measure how quickly are they growing, but look at another factors, look at indicator species. And indicator species are plants that have a really narrow tolerance range that they only like to grow in 
certain soil types and certain moisture types. So we'll grow in the kind of these rich mesic soils that sugar maple also like to grow. So if you walk through your forest and you see some of these plants, you probably have more of a nutrient rich soil. So like the maiden hair fern um, or blue cohosh or Dutchman breeches, you know, if you see those, those are usually a good sign that um, you have some healthier soils. Wood nettle, ginseng, ginseng loves calcium as well. So it grows really great with sugar maple, the squirrel corn, um, it's like the Dutchman breeches, but a little bit different. Um, so those are all um, important things to think about or things that you can look for um, in trying to just get an idea of what are your soils like. So as we, we think about our diversity throughout our forest, we don't want 100% maple throughout our forest. You know, that was, that used to be the standard, you know, it makes sense as a maple producer. If we have, we want to tap maples and that's all we care about. So we tap maples, but we know that that's not the best thing to do anymore. That the recommendation that we provide is that you want to have about 75% sugar maple, or we can say soft maple, red maple, whatever you want to call it. So 75% maple and 25% non-maple. So I have sugar maple here, but I should just say maple. So 25% non-maple. And why that is, is you want to have a diversity of species. We don't want monocultures in our forest. And so if you have a pest outbreak, if you have Eastern tent caterpillar that come in, Eastern tent caterpillar is oftentimes going to want to go to birch or cherry trees first, and so let them feed on that and not, you know, if, the maple, if it's only maples, then they're just gonna go to the maples. So maybe they'll go to other pests first um, or other species first, so it can help with pests. It can also help with your soil health. As we learn more and more as the soil science kind of community is learning more and more about our soils and the different microbiota in their soils and mycorrhiza, and that, you know, these soils are more active living organisms in itself with all the microbiota that's in there. And if you have one diversity of species, then you're probably not going to have as broad of diversity of microbiota, which is healthy for providing nutrients in our soils. Um, and so if you get different variation of species in there, your soils are going to be diverse in microbiota and those are going to be healthier soils overall also. So Think about a mix of different species. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect 25%, but just making sure that, you know, you're not overly selecting just for maple throughout your forest. I have a diversity of species. Um, and, and with that, you know, as sugar maples, sugar producers, we oftentimes typically try to avoid conifers. Those make your soils a little bit more acidic, but also that's usually where squirrels like the nest. And for those who put up tubing know that, Squirrels are awful uh, for that. And so if we reduce conifers, we're reducing squirrel nesting sites, and that doesn't mean that I don't go out in my forest and eliminate all my conifers. They're still out there. So I still want to have some around. But um, if you are looking to get rid of something, that is one thing to reduce. Um, so know your resources. You know, we're thinking about our managing our forests that, you know, Go, again, going back out there, assess the number of trees per acre. We have some tools on our website at cornellmaple.com where you can, um, some tools that you can actually use instead of going out there and counting individual trees, we have a quick assessment tool, but know how many trees per acre that you have, what should it be, which is gonna depend on the size of the trees, what's the age of your trees, the tree size I mentioned, the growth rate, what's the tap hole, what's the rate, what's the tap hole closure rate, what are different thrusty resources that we talk about. So. One grade for going back up here to, to the growth rate and your tap hole heel rate, you know, as maple producers, I hope that you are when you're going out and tapping your trees each year that you're looking back at old tap holes and see how quickly are those growing. That's a really nice, quick, dirty way to figure out the growth of your trees. You know, you don't have to go out there and take a tape measure and measure the diameter each year, but just look at how quickly is that tap hole closing up. And if it's taking you know, three years or more for that tap hole to completely pucker up and close, then, you know, the tree is not growing really quickly. Or, you know, three years later, it's almost a complete circle still. You know that that's not an active, healthy tree um, within there. So definitely look at the old tap holes and that'll give you an idea of growth, uh, the growth of the tree. And it should be closing up within, you know, two years is a great, you know, if you can close within a year, halfway within a year, that's great growth, you know, completely or almost completely close in two years is great. Three years, that's not too bad. 
overall, but if it's more than that, that's definitely not great. Uh, so we just asked what's the, the name of the website for helping engaging trees per acre. That's cornellmaple.com. Um, we have resource, uh, I will, I have a slide at the end where I have that up. Also forestconnect.com um, is our Cornell forestry um, extension website that Peter Smallage does. That also has some resources as well. So I'll, I'll have that website up at the end, but cornellmaple.com has a lot of different resources on other things besides sugar bush management, but we have a section and we have a notebook on sugar bush management as well. Good question. Uh, so threats to your resources. So when I'm talking about threats, um, going beyond just what are the threats of us as humans going out there and poorly hanging our tubing system that's potentially girdling our trees like this picture. So that, that's certainly a threat, but thinking more about uh, pests like the Asian longhorn beetle that we worry about that could potentially come in and uh, wipe out our maple trees. The pine sawyer beater, beetle here in the middle, um, I put this up in as a comparison. This is not a uh, pest uh, per se, but just comparison to the Asian longhorn beetle. So if you see the pine sawyer, the antennae are not as long and it doesn't have the white dots, um, but the Asian longhorn beetle, something we're always being mindful of. Emerald ash borer, um, not something that's gonna kill our maple trees, but again, that's gonna change our forest dynamics. And if we have maple and ash and all the ash are gone, do we have other diversity? Or is it gonna to create too much sunlight? Or are there other, you know, are now invasive species gonna grow into that? Um, that's open canopies now or, or, you know, other things. So the emerald ash borer is not killing our maples, but what is it doing to our forest? Um, in replacement. One new one that you may not, you probably haven't heard of, um, it's actually down in Pennsylvania, and I think they just recently found a little bit of some starting to get established potentially in southern New York. Um, it's probably a matter of time before it's into New York. There's a spotter and lantern fly. It's a beautiful one. It's an adult one. Its wings are open like this. It looks more like a moth, but it's actually a sap feeding insect that feeds on the tree of heaven. Um, it's a tree or a lanthus tree, which is an invasive tree in and of itself. Um, but it, it, there is some signs that it will also feed on maples, probably not going to kill them, but again, it's going to cause some stress to those trees, the sap feeding that they, they're in massive swarms on the trees. So I won't spend too much time on it because it's probably far off from you guys, but it could potentially get out there eventually, um, just like the Asian lung, or the emerald ash borer has spread. Um, one that is pretty common that it is more of a native, but gets these large outbreaks is the Eastern tent caterpillar. Big we can get these large heavy defoliations in certain years from time to time in regions um, that can really cut back on the tree. And that's where, you know, if your trees oftentimes will try to leave out again, but if the trees aren't healthy, what is that? What stress is that putting on um, the trees? A native pest um, that this is native, but the sugar maple borer, you've probably seen these marks on your trees before where you see this kind of open scar with, and you'll see this kind of horizontal line or sometimes it'll be diagonal or zigzag a little bit. Um, that's the sugar maple borer where the larva will feed under there. It doesn't typically go all the way around the tree, so it's not girdling it, but if you get three or four of those, that's a, that's a weak point on the tree and it could potentially cut down the flow. It's usually not, you know, it's not killing a tree, but it can have some issues, but you oftentimes, you know, you'll see this throughout your forest. It's not something to get alarmed on, you know, it's not every tree. Um, and again, the trees are usually okay, but it is stress on the tree. Um, there's a really severe case of it on a smaller tree. Uh, another one is freeze thaw cycles. This is one that we see more and more happening that is we don't have as much snowpack. Snowpack in our forest is really important because remember those roots, as I mentioned, are really only in the top few inches. Uh, and if we don't get that insulating snowpack, and if you get these freeze thaw, these really heavy freezes without that snow covering it, you know that could potentially damage tree roots, um, freeze those tree roots that are um, not protected and kill those off. And that can potentially impact the overall health of the tree as well. Um, this goes, so back to a question. So we asked about earthworms. Are earthworms actually good or bad? And, you know, we're always taught typically earthworms are, are great, right, to have in our soils. They help aerate it. They help with decomposition. But I actually want to be here today, if you haven't heard before, that earthworms are actually bad in our forests. They're, they're not typically uh, native um, within most of our soils. Most of the earthworms that we have are from Europe or from Asia that have 
um, come in and are spread through farming or through fishermen throwing out their bait. Um, so they're, they're actually not something we do want to have in our soils. They're great in our gardens and our compost piles, but not great in our forest. Um, and so the, uh, if we look at this picture right at the top up here, this is a picture uh, where no earthworms, we get this nice thick leaf layer on top and then it kind of slowly breaks down. We get this good thicker organic matter that holds a lot of uh, water and nutrients, insulating factors as well. So we don't get that, helps with that freeze thaw cycles a little bit. Where down here at the bottom where earthworms are present, you'll see some whole leaves on top, but then it's right down into kind of this sort of organic -y soil. You know, it's great again for growing in a garden, but not for your forest where you don't have as insulating. They break down that leaf litter too quickly and they're faster than what the roots can take it up. And so some of that will leach away and also disturb some of the microbiota and natural herbaceous plants that should be growing in the understory. So earthworms are not always great um, to have. And so somebody had asked in the question, um, does this affect the soil and sap production? So it does affect soils. There has not been any studies that I'm aware of that has looked at sap production in soils with earthworms versus sites without earthworms. Um, but there what has been some studies, I think one out of some studies done in, in Michigan, I believe it was um, upper Michigan, that looked at sugar maple health and earthworms versus non-earthworm. And I believe the sites that had earthworm activity were about 30% less healthy than the sites that did not have earthworms. So, you know, we put that in, that can eventually, you know, potentially affect the sap production as well. So there's not a direct correlation there, but certainly a, a, certain, a part of that. Again, just what we want to see, this is what, you know, no earthworms, we get this duff layer and then this nice organic soil and slowly works down into the mineral soil versus earthworms, they just mix those layers around at the top. Um, other threats, uh, this isn't an exhaustive list, but just invasive plants, as I already mentioned, coming in, out competing, your regeneration within your forest. You know, we want to remove invasive plants out of our forest. Um, and again, there's many others I could put on this list. Uh, one that is a big issue as well is deer impact on regeneration. You know, we think about, and this isn't necessarily, this is going beyond just the the soil or the tree, the trees that we're tapping, but thinking long term, what is the long term forest going to be like? What trees are going to have to tap in the future? And deer will definitely, the browsing of deer um, munching on our young sugar maples and other seedlings um, that impacts that regeneration. And so we don't have great regeneration, most of our forests, um, because of the deer impact. Um, so things that you can do to try to limit that, whether you're fencing off or trying when you cut down trees to leave whole canopies so trees can grow up inside of that where it's harder for the deer to get inside um, of a whole top of a tree, which is hard when you're trying to run tubing and stuff. But if you can leave whole canopies, that's actually better um, in your forest. So I bring this, we bring these all up and, you know, each of those threats oftentimes, you know, outside of maybe Asian longhorn beetle, most of the time, each of those threats aren't going to kill a tree altogether. But I bring this up in this uh, tree disease um, spiral, decline spiral, and that when you have all these different factors, these different predisposing factors, such as, you know, you have poor soil, poor nutrients, poor water holding capacity or something like that, the trees are going to be stressed. Stressed trees aren't going to be resilient. They're not going to be able to bounce back. You get, you know, Eastern 10 caterpillar or something like that that comes in and defoliates it. Again, it's not going to be bounced back as well. It's not going to be as healthy. You get competition from invasives um, or beach thickets and stuff that are taking water nutrients away from that. It's impacting your regeneration. You know, all those are going to just kind of spiral down and um, could ultimately lead to the death of those trees as well, or just not being as resilient, not going to be as healthy. And then what trees are coming in after that, if you have deer feeding on it, if you have beach thickets, um, so it's important to think about all those factors together are impacting the health of your trees overall. Um, and so to step away from that a little bit, I think about, you know, another thing is with healthy trees are going to be tapped correctly. And so we want to make sure that we're tapping our trees correctly. Um, so I, I like to put up this picture to look at, you know, is this tree healthy? Well, you know, if we look at this and 
this is a great, I like this picture because it shows all these different tap holes that are on here. But the reason why all these tap holes are easy to see is that they're all nice and round. And so is that a healthy tree? As I mentioned before, you know, you shouldn't see multiple round hole tree, round holes still because that tree, if it's growing, should be closing that up and they're not going to be nice and round anymore. And sure enough, you look up on this tree and it was completely snagged at the top. Um, and, you know, previously there was one, there's one little branch coming off of it, you know, so it was still a live tree, but it wasn't healthy. It wasn't growing. That's not, so the question is, do we tap that tree? Um, one this bad, I probably wouldn't do that. You know, if there is a, you know, there, there's different ways you can look at it. Uh, one is, well, if I already have my drop line right there, the tubing's running by it, I'm not going to get much from it, but I might as well suck whatever I can out of it, right? Because it's dying, it's on its way out. Um, do I take what I can? But on the flip side, are you creating a vacuum leak? You know, if you're running high, trying to run high vacuum and you're near these old tap holes that aren't healed and sealed up, those are vacuum leaks. So are you going to create a vacuum leak um, in that you're also spending money on a new tap, a tap every year? So are you going to get the sap back to pay for that? So something this bad, I wouldn't, you know, sometimes it goes back and forth. That's a judgment call that you have to make. Um, so tapping guidelines that uh, we like to recommend at the Cornell Maple Program. Um, one tap, you should wait till your tree is about 10 inches in diameter before you put in a tap. Um, and you shouldn't put a second tap in, I say 20 inches or more before you put a second tap. But I don't really like saying that. I don't, I, I don't like giving a, that diameter measurement. You know, one rule of thumb is that you can, if you can go up and hug a tree and if your hands touch when you reach around the tree and if they touch on the other side, then that tree's not big enough to put a second tap. Um, if they don't touch, then you can put a second tap. It's gonna depend on how long your arms are. Um, so that can vary, but what it really comes down to, I don't care if it's a, if you're deciding whether it's an eight inch or 10 inch tree to put one tap in or when you're deciding to put a second tap in is how quickly is that tree growing? Is it going to be able to produce enough new growth over time that you can continue to sustainably tap that tree and have new wood so that you're not going to run out of new wood because of the compartmentalization that's going to form. And so it's looking at the health of those trees. You can have a 10 inch tree that can be just as old as the 20 inch tree next to it. And that 10 inch tree may be big enough to start tapping, but it's growing so slow because it's being suppressed maybe by that 20 inch tree. It's growing so slow that it's not going to be able to put on enough new growth to sustainably have tree the wood to tap into in 10 or 20 years. And so is it worthwhile? And the same thing with two taps. Is that tree really growing quick enough? Because remember, in two taps, you're only going halfway around the tree and you have to have a couple inches of new growth to be able to tap into. Again, so is there enough new growth to do that? So you have to assess and kind of make that judgment. You know, we're not going to, you can measure that over time, but it's going to be hard to do that. But it's looking at the overall health of the canopy, looking at past tap holes, how quickly is it closing? And also remember that if you are, now this will vary, but you know, if you're on buckets, two taps, double the production, yes, oftentimes in buckets or with just gravity tubing without any type of vacuum, whether it's artificial or natural or um, yeah, artificial or natural vacuum. But if you are on vacuum, having two taps doesn't mean twice as much sap. It's maybe more like one and a half times the amount by adding that second tap. Um, or sometimes uh, Proctor Maple Research Center out of Vermont recently did some studies and found they were on a little bit smaller trees, but they found with, a, and I think there were more like 14 inch trees, but when they added a second tap, so when they compared trees with one tap versus trees with two tap, they had the same amount of sap that was collected. So same amount of sap from one tap in one tree as there was from the two taps together in another tree. And so it didn't matter other than you have higher material costs. Um, so it's best to stick with one. So in my forest in Lake Placid, we stick with one tap for each of our trees because I just know that my trees, it's a short growing season up here. Our soils are not as nutrient rich. They're not as healthy of trees. And so it's not worth me putting, I know I'm not producing enough growth to have two taps in some of those larger trees. We just, especially when you get a really big tree, oftentimes those can slow down and not grow as quickly. So 
we stick to just one tree and try to be productive from that one spout per tree. Um, as far as depths, uh, inch and a half to two inches. Uh, I didn't put in any charts, but University of Vermont has also done several studies and they recently redid some of that. Again, looking at tap hole depth and production, they found once you hit two inches, production kind of flattens out. There's no reason to go more than two inches. Going up from an inch and a half to two inches did give them a little bit. I think it was close to 20% increase in production. So two inches can be good, but remember that if you're tapping, you know, if they're new trees that you haven't tapped for very long or tapped at all, sure go two inches because it really doesn't matter. You know, you're not going to potentially hit old tap holes. You know, you could have had a cavity or something, but um, if you're tapping trees that have been tapped for 50, 60 years or more, you know, if you have old tap holes in here with new growth over top of that, if you tap too deep, you could, and if those trees aren't growing quick enough, you could hit that old tap hole and that's going to decrease your production. So keeping that in mind um, that, you know, I like this for our woods again, because I know they're not putting on as much active growth and we have tapped some of those trees for 60 years now that more in the inch and a half, inch and three quarters is more my preference. Um, but two inches is somewhere between that inch and a half to two inches is great. We like to practice what we call pattern tapping. Pattern tapping is, um, so we keep this sort of systematic, so we're trying to help avoid old hitting old tap holes. And we found that when we practice pattern tapping that we have less of a chance of hitting old tap holes and decreasing our production or having vacuum leaks. So we like to, um, you know, always make sure we're into new wood, new healthy saplings. So it doesn't matter the pattern. You're always still making sure that there's no old uh, tap holes that we're getting into. But we're usually shifting over at least an inch or two, either left or right. So this one, we're working around from the right to the left. So we're shifting over at least an inch or more, and we're going up or down at least eight to 12 inches typically. Um, and then we'll put that tap hole. And then the next one will shift over an inch or two and then come down eight to 10 inches. Um, so we're keeping that pattern. We're slowly going up and down. This going up and down is going to avoid less of a chance of hitting or creating a vacuum leak from the tap hole from previous years. Um, we can see this is, again, this tree where it wasn't growing really quickly. So a big old that uh, could potentially become a vacuum leak. I, would, I don't like these to be in a straight line. We don't want a straight line tap. It's best to stagger. So this isn't the best example. Um, it would have been better if this was maybe a little more up here. Um, so it's a little bit more staggered and less chance of causing vacuum. From that, I have seen on some trees that aren't healed up quick as well that vacuum will come across, but definitely if it's above or below, um, I've had some this year that folks unfortunately had tapped too close or above or below. Besides the potential of being in compartmentalized wood where there is no healthy sap flow, it, they were vacuum leaks as well. Um, so, so that's, this is this pattern that we follow and we, we stick with that. So instead of the, the alternative is haphazard task tapping, where you're just going and sticking in wherever you think there's new wood, but it's hard to, you know, are you in that same? So if you can, it doesn't have to be exactly this pattern, but I do like to kind of just slowly keep working around that tree. So that by the time we get back around, we have a couple inches of new wood, hopefully that we can tap into. Um, the, and then as you can also see, we also put a little bit of paint when we go to pull the spout at the end of the year, we put a drop, a dot of paint below the tap hole, not in the tap hole, but below it. So that we know the different colors And that way. Um, I try to use a different color each year. Unfortunately before me, they were used orange for a few years in a row. Um, so I need to get a, a new updated picture where you can get the different variation. This year we used blue, we had yellow the year before, and then we had green. So um, we can look at, all right, green was last year. Uh, what was last year's tap hole? How quickly did it close? You know, yellow the year before that or whatever. Um, how quickly did it grow close from two years ago? Um, so that's a good way to look at that. If you are certified organic, you'd have to check with your certifying agency, but oftentimes they don't allow paint on trees. So um, question from Gregory asking, when tapping below the lateral line, is there a specific way to manage your drop or to prevent contamination of the tap hole? Uh, so just as a there has been research done at the E-Line Forest before my time by my predecessor, Mike Farrell, and UVM, Proctor Maple Center, has done tapping below the lateral line. Um, so if we run out of space to tap in our tapping band above the lateral, 
Um, can you go below for our save free Sarah laterals right here? Coming across, can we go below that? And found that as long as we have high vacuum, you have to have high vacuum because you had to be able to pull that sap up. Um, your production could be just as good as if you tapped above the lateral. So it's okay to tap below the lateral. It's not my first choice. Um, but if I'm running out of good wood to tap into, we will go below the lateral. With that, I still like to keep the bottom of the spout pointed straight down. So that any sap will come out and drop down into the lateral or into the drop line and then get pulled up. So I don't like that drop pointed up that's coming out of the spout, the tubing part pointed up because that sap could still come down and push back into the tap hole. So just from a contamination, there's still there's going to be sap near that tap hole, but I like to just let that drop and let it have a little bit of a dip in that drop so it'll come out into that dip and not go right back. It's not pushing up against the tap hole. Um, Daniel asks, is there a preferred time of year to thin smaller maple trees from a sugar bush? Um, yes, no, not necessarily. Um, it's more of what's probably the most convenient for you. It depends on what type of equipment you're using. You know, if you're using equipment to go in there, you don't want to do it when the ground's wet in the spring or the fall. So either in the summertime when the ground's dry or in the wintertime when it's frozen, or you got a nice snowpack um, for you, um, you know, if and also make springs not great if you're rubbing up against other trees that you want to keep because the bark is softer and can easily slip off at that time of the year. Um, but wintertime is oftentimes best to create the less damage if you're bringing equipment in and then create sunlight for new regeneration in the understory. Uh, just a reminder as a refresher, hopefully most of you have seen images before of the stain column that's formed within a tree that can go up or down eight to 10 inches at least typically, but oftentimes up sometimes, especially the old 716s, three feet on either side. So that's a big gap. We gotta make sure we stay away from that so don't go right up above or below. Um, and there's our stain column. It's the width of the tap hole, the depth of the tap hole, and then that up or down. Um, eight to 10 inches or more. Sometimes this mentions up to 32 inches. So when our, we're thinking about tapping again, going back to, do we have enough growth? We don't want to come in with this new tap hole and we're hitting into that old stain column. The stain columns do taper down like this as well. All right. So thinking about tree growth, uh, we want to encourage these nice, you know, we want to have room around the outside of the canopy of the trees to be able to, so they're not, intertwine too much. And we want to, in sugar maple trees that we're tapping for sugar bush, we want to create these depth of canopy. That's going to give you more total leaf volume, leaf area, so that you can have more leaves or more sugar production. So if we get these deeper canopies, this tree on the right is a uh, open grown tree. So that's not a good example of in our forest, but this one on the left does show us some little more depth. It's a narrower canopy, but it has good depth in there. Um, so we to encourage good tree growth, we want these, these vigorous crowns. We need a healthy root system to do that. Um, so a productive crown, we want uh, this high live crown ratio. That's looking at, that's that depth. So the ratio of the living crown versus the total type of the tree, total height of the tree. We want that to be high. We want good wide canopies at, as well. Um, and we want low transparency. So we don't, you know, that's a thin crown. If there's a lot of dieback within there where there's a lot of light still coming through, um, we want that to, to be a nice thick dense with lots of leaves in the canopy. Um, so if we're thinking about thinning trees, um, it can be, it's a great option. It's also okay to cut a maple tree. My colleague, Peter Smallage, who's our state extension forester, likes to tell people that, you know, it's okay to cut a maple tree, that, you know, not all maple trees are perfect, that we do want to remove, especially those unhealthy ones, you know, to get that stocking of 75% maple, 25% other hardwoods that are desirable that we want in our forest. A rule of thumb is 70 to 100 trees. This is going to depend on the size of your trees. You know, if your trees are smaller, 100 trees per acre. If they're smaller, it could be down more. More even oftentimes 60 to 80 trees per acre. Um, another rule of thumb is roughly around that gives you about 22 foot spacing from tree to tree. So if you stand next to a tree, the next trees around it should be roughly around average of 22 feet from tree trunk to tree trunk. Um, if you're looking at thinning out trees, you know, try to keep your high vigor 
your low risk trees and low risk trees are ones that have a single stem. They don't have lots of sugar maple bore that are weak points that could easily snap. They have these deep wide crowns. If you're individually tapping trees and buckets, you can look at the sap sugar to understand, you know, in tubing, it's hard to know what individual sap sweetness is, but, you know, remove the trees, you know, it's okay to cut a maple tree, but don't cut your, you don't have to cut your nicest maple tree, but cut the lower grade ones um, that aren't going to be as productive. And also important to remember that a, a timber forest is different than a sugar bush. A timber forest, you don't want those big deep crowns because that's more, um, that's not going to give you a nice as long of log and there's going to be more branching in there. So it's not as great for timber. So those timber trees, we're, we manage a little bit different. We want those a little tighter uh, so that we get, because we're going for the log or the sugar bush, we want that deep crown for sugar production. So there are, there are some differences within how those are managed. Um, one option, if you have an area where maybe you you don't have good regeneration in your forests and you have some trees that are maybe dying back is to do these group selections or patch cuts where you take out a whole section and try to restart that um, forest from day zero where you're going to allow new species to come in regeneration, bring in sunlight, get new species established. That can be help, uh, helpful, you know, create these big open gaps, allow sunlight because sunlight is typically the most limited resource for maple trees. So sunlight is important to have, um, or for a forest in general. So our, you know, our, in the, our, typically our forests, you know, throughout the kind of the Great Lakes area, Northeast is sunlight's the most limiting resource of forest. Um, important to think about your roads, optimize those effectively, use a topo map, um, lay out those roads collect correctly. Um, that's going to, you know, again, we don't want that soil erosion. We don't want to be damaging roots. Keep shallow grades, keep the water off them, keep them straight so that you're um, more turns. You're going to be digging things up a little bit more. So think about your roads when you're putting it out there. And then as I, I kind of started with, what else can you do within your sugar bush? So think more besides just tapping trees, but tapping maples, but can we tap uh, birch trees or um, beech trees, can we grow mushrooms in the understory? Are there you know, ginseng and other things that we want to collect? Is there firewood we can get, saw logs we can potentially get out of that forest? It doesn't have to be limited to just tapping maple trees. Um, so just finishing up with different tools for sugar bush management, some technical assistance. Oftentimes your state forestry agency will help you write a sugar bush management plan. They have lists of consulting foresters you can work with, different contract examples or um, private foresters will also be helpful for that. Your local soil and water conservation district is a great resource. And there's sometimes some grants for helping for um, reducing like erosion and helping put in roadways and um, soil drainage when roadways within your forest. So sometimes they have funding to even help with some of that. Um, so they're a great person to make a connection with. From some educational guidance, your state cooperative extension can be helpful oftentimes. Um, Jesse Randall at the, is a little bit closer to you at the Michigan um, UP Forestry Innovation Center, has some great resources. The Cornell Forest Connect that my colleague Peter Smolich manages, forestconnect.com, has a lot of great forestry-based resources that I'd highly recommend. He does a monthly webinar, he has YouTube videos. Um, and then the, the Cornell Sugarbush Management Notebook that we have, which is on our cornellmaple.com website. And that's where you can also, we have that uh, a tool or sheet that tells you how to assess taps per acre at cornellmaple.com um, also. So those are just a, a few resources. Um, I'll leave this up and we have a, just a couple minutes left and I'll turn it over to any questions anybody may have. Great that we had some, some questions in the chat, but if you have any other questions you want to jump in with now, feel free to put them in the chat. I have that open. I'll manage that. Or you can unmute yourself and jump in. Hi, Adam. So if our tap holes haven't closed, should we stop tapping those trees? Should we give them a break or what do you suggest? Yeah, that's a, it's a tough question. I mean, in some ways that it's, do you, because it depends as a tree by tree case, because if you look at that tree and it's like, well, if I give this tree a break, will it come back around? Or is it a tree that is probably going to be on its way out? And do I milk it for what all of that it's got? And so that's 
it has to be kind of an individual basis per tree on what level is that. Um, oftentimes, you know, if they're really not closing, it's a tree that, you know, if you, if it's a case where maybe you need to take it out, that if you want to do some thinning, those are great ways, great, great selection of trees to take out as well. Um, so we certainly have some in our forest. We continue to tap them. It's not that they're, they're not great. You just have to be a little more mindful of tapping them. And it just depends on what level they are. So it, it depends, I guess. It's a, if you think, you know, giving them a break can potentially help. Um, we are taking, you know, the reserves that we take is not a huge amount. I was reading a paper recently that it's really some estimates are probably more in the around six to eight percent or less of the stored carbohydrate reserves, stored carbon pool within a maple tree that we're actually taking on a more less healthy trees, I think was a little bit, you know, higher in the eight percent, but it's it's not too bad overall that we're taking. So taking that little bit is not a huge detriment to the tree. Um, but it's more of if that is happening, being mindful of vacuum production or is, should you think about, do we need to put some lime in the forest or something like that too? 